With more than 55 million items, the Library of Congress Manuscript Division contains the papers of 23 presidents from George Washington to Calvin Coolidge. Among those papers are manuscripts on Islam, many written by our founding fathers dating back to America's colonial period. In this edition of the Islamic Forum, we'll share an article written by the Library of Congress Manuscript Division Chief James Hudson, drawing upon the papers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and other primary documents to discuss the relationship of Islam to the new nation. Islam has held a presence in America predating Columbus, although evidence suggests that substantial numbers of Americans view their Muslim neighbors as an alien presence outside the limits of American life and history. While other minorities, African Americans, Hispanic, and Native Americans, were living within the boundaries of the present-day United States from the earliest days of the nation, Muslims are perceived to have had no part in the American experience. Viewers may be surprised to learn that there were thousands of Muslims in the United States in 1776. Many imported as slaves from areas of Africa where Islam flourished, while historic records also show that a sizable population consisted of white Muslims of European descent. It is also evident that the Founding Fathers precisely thought about the relationship of Islam to the new nation and were prepared to make a place for it in the Republic. In his seminal letter on toleration, written in 1689, John Locke insisted that Muslims and all others who believed in God be tolerated in England. Campaigning for religious freedom in Virginia, Jefferson followed Locke, his idol, in demanding recognition of the religious rights of the Mohammedan or the Muslim, the Jew and the pagan. Support Supporting Jefferson was his old ally, Richard Henry Lee, who had made a motion in Congress on June 7, 1776, that the American colonies declare independence. True freedom, Lee asserted, embraces the Muslim and the Hindu as well as the Christian religion. In his autobiography, Jefferson recounted with much satisfaction that in the struggle to pass his landmark bill for establishing religious freedom in 1786, the Virginia legislature rejected by a great majority an effort to limit the bill's scope, in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan. George Washington suggested a way for Muslims to obtain proper relief from a proposed Virginia bill laying taxes to support Christian worship. On another occasion, the first president declared that he would welcome Mohammedans to Mount Vernon if they were good workmen. Officials in Massachusetts were equally insistent that their influential Constitution of 1780 afforded the most ample liberty of conscience to deists, Mohammedans, Jews, and Christians, a point that Chief Justice Theophilus Parsons resoundingly affirmed in 1810. Toward Islam itself, the founding generation held deferring views. An evangelical Baptist spokesman denounced Muhammad as a hateful figure who, unlike the meek and gentle Jesus, spread his religion at the point of a sword. A Presbyterian preacher in rural South Carolina dusted off Grotius' 17th century reproach that the religion of Muhammad originated in arms, breeds nothing but arms, is propagated by arms. Other, more influential observers held a different view of Muslims. In 1783, the president of Yale, Ezra Stiles, cited a study showing that Islamic morals were far superior to Christian morals. Another New Englander believed that the moral principles that were inculcated by their teachers had a happy tendency to render them good members of society. The reference here, as other commentators made clear, was to Islam's belief, which it shared with Christianity, in a future state of rewards and punishments, a system of celestial carrots and sticks which the founding generation considered necessary to guarantee good social conduct. 
A Mahometan, wrote a Boston newspaper columnist, is excited to the practice of good morals and hope. hope. Benjamin Rush, the Pennsylvania signer of the Declaration of Independence and friend of Adams and Jefferson, applauded this feature of Islam, asserting that he had rather see the opinions of Confucius or Muhammad inculcated upon our youth than see them grow up wholly devoid of a system of religious principles. That ordinary citizens shared these positive views is demonstrated by a petition of a group of citizens of Chesterfield County, Virginia, to the State Assembly, November 14, 1785. Let Jews, Mohammedans, and Christians of every denomination enjoy religious liberty. Thrust them not out now by establishing the Christian religion, lest thereby we become our own enemies and weaken this infant state. It is men's labor in our manufactories, their service by sea and land, that aggrandize our country, and not their creeds. Let Jews, Mohammedans, and Christians of every denomination find their advantage in living under your laws. The founders of this nation explicitly included Islam in their vision of the future of the Republic. Freedom of religion, as they conceived it, encompassed it. Adherents of the faith were, with some exceptions, regarded as men and women who would make law-abiding, productive citizens. Far from fearing Islam, it is certain that the Founding Fathers would have incorporated Islam into the fabric of American life.